me a little bit of time, but there you go. I'm, I am at the bottom of the world, so you can expect it. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and start us off. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Omega Files. I'm your host, Dr. Freedom. And tonight we've had a chance to sit down and have a little talk with Mark Strickson, who was formerly on Doctor Who, but left acting and went off and did some pretty damned amazing things that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight. Now, when I say your guys' name, go ahead and give your, you know, quick intro to, you know, tell Mark where you're from. So let's start with Matt. Hello, my name is Matt, and I'm already associated with Mark because we met a few months ago at Birmingham. That's right. Yes, it's nice to see you again. All right, Alex? Yes, hello, I'm Alex, and I'm from Massachusetts in the United States of America. All right, Elijah? Hello, I'm Elijah, and I'm from Minnesota here in the USA. And Philip Archer. Hello, Mark. I'm Philip Archer. I'm from London, North London, basically. Okay. Now, before we get started off, and I'll get these guys asking their questions now, you mentioned to me earlier you're working on a little thing for Discovery regarding dinosaurs. Can you tell us a little bit about it, Mark? It's not a little thing. <laughs> <laughs> Six one hours, and trust me, that feels like a lot from where I'm sitting. Um, yeah, um, it's about animals in... Australia and New Zealand that are either have dinosaur ancestors or uh, so are related in some way um, filled an e environmental niche when the dinosaurs died um, so that there's always got to be a relation to dinosaurs with the animal all right so structurally you know physiologically um, all those sorts of things so we're doing six one hours and going all over Australia and New Zealand and filming weird animals and, of course, I'm back on crocodiles and snakes again, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, it seems like you started out there with crocodiles and snakes. We're all back there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, this, this next week, I'm going out on Wednesday for a four-day shoot to dig up the skull of a whale fossil, a whale skull. Wow, okay. All right, let me get these guys started. All right, let's start. Let me pick a batting order. All right, let's start with Alex. First question. Well, um, you've probably heard this question before. Um, this is also for a fan that couldn't be here. Uh, what was it like working on Modern Undead, and how, uh, how much time did you spend with Nicholas Courtney that is no longer with us? And what, and what did you feel the, the story and the experience was like filming that story of Dr. Who? Well, it's, um, it's a, a baptism of fire because when we did Doctor Who, you didn't have any rehearsal. So, and um, for the filming, they did the filming first, then they did the studio. And before you had the studio sections, um, you, you, you had rehearsal, but you went straight into filming. Um, and I, you know, as a new character, that is incredibly difficult. Um, you're stuck with what you do on day one. Um, so John Nathan Turner was there and I did that first scene. The first scene we shot was by the car where I get in the car and drive off that scene. And um, he just sort of took me aside at, after and he said, can you be a bit posher, Mark? And I said, no, <laughs> that's as posh as I get. And so John very kindly and very wisely said, well, you just stick as you are because it's fine by me. Um, because I think John was very aware that you, you've got to be happy in your character if you're going to just continue with that forever you can't change it. It, it it's set in stone from day one you can't even go back and film day one um it was great fun there's, there's that first filming and um nick was really lovely and um he was he was always very welcoming to younger actors but i'd you know sit sit in the coach with him and have a chat about acting and yarn about doctor who and he filled me in a lot um and i think the story was actually pretty strong it was certainly very strong for me it was a very strong introduction to uh, an assistant. If you want to call Turner a doctor assistant, which he sort of was, but sort of wasn't. <laughs> well, my follow-up question very quickly, if, uh, if, if, you, if that's all you can recall at, the, at this moment, if they asked you to come back for the revival, would you do it? Yeah, yeah, I would. Um, I didn't stop being an actor because I, I, I sort of stopped being an actor because I wanted to do something a little bit more serious and help save the world a bit. And so I went off and did a zoology degree and the, the rest is history. Um, I never expected to be a natural history or TV producer for so long. I mean, I've been doing it for over 20 years now. Um, 
<laughs> like any job, it, gets a, it can get a bit repetitive. Um, and maybe I'll do something else again soon, or maybe do some, do some more acting. I really miss acting. I, I miss actors, the lovely people be around. Um, I've got a friend of, who studied with me at the Royal Academy, Rada, um, coming out to a show tour in New Zealand who's coming to stay. So I do get to see people very occasionally. But yeah, I miss my friends. I miss the life of being an actor. So it's quite nice to do Doctor Who conventions because you see each other. Okay, next up, Matt Rose. Oh, hello, Mark. Before I start, um, Jenny Shirt sends her love because she's in Regenerations at the minute in Swansea. Um, she wanted to say hello. Um, so my question for you is, though that you've given up acting, how did you first hear about um, Big Finish? Because you've been doing it for a couple of years now with, and you're doing the novel that's coming out in December. How did you first hear of them? Um, yeah, so it's, it's King's Demons, is it, coming out in December? Is that when it's coming out? Um, no, it's the... That one's already um, out. That one's already out. That's already out, isn't it? Cold say. Fusion. Cold Fusion. But how did you first hear of them? All right, okay. Um, I, I, do as I can't remember. <laughs> but I know that I was one of the first people to ever do a big finish. Um, so I've been doing them for a lot more than two years. Um, yeah, you, that was Phantasmagora. That was yeah, yeah, yeah. And if anybody oh, can... What, what, what year was that? Can anybody know? Does anybody know? Um, 2001, I think. I'm not sure. Oh, it was 10 years ago. So, yeah, it, it, it's um, certainly more than two years. I really enjoy doing them. Um, one, because I enjoy the process of acting. Um, two, because I get to meet my friends. And, and sometimes. <laughs> um, some of the big finishes I've actually done in a sound studio in New Zealand. Oh, there's the secret, right? But I think only, only two of them have I ever had to record um, remotely. So, in fact, last year I did one or two and we recorded that in a sound studio in Scotland with the other guys somewhere completely different because I was working running ITV's Edinburgh office the whole of last year in Scotland and I didn't have time to get down to London so it was not going to be possible so I just did it in my sound studio up there um, but it's like you know when you I should explain when you record something you're in all the, all the actors are in different booths you don't look at each other right you you a little bit of technique for you um you you talk to the microphone as if it's the other actor so that you get the distance right okay so we're not all sitting around in a circle or in, even in booths where we can see each other so it makes absolutely no difference really if I do it remotely or if I'm in the same room I get exactly the same experience it's nice to be in the same room it's nice to see the guys, and, 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 um, but it's not, it, in terms of the creative process, it's not essential. Um, so, you yeah, know, I love the Big Finish one because you get to do different things, and it's radio, and so you can do even madder things than you can in television on Doctor Who. You know, the, the, the sky's the limit. So, um, yeah, you know, and, and I mean, lovely working with um, Lisa Bauman, who's very involved in them, who I work with as an actor at Salisbury Playhouse um, in two plays. And we know each other very well, so it's always nice to see her. Yeah. I think, I sometimes say this, you know, people say, what's it like being an actor? And I say, well, it's, it's a bit the same as any other job. That if you like the people you work with, it makes a huge difference, right? It doesn't matter what the job is. If you go into an office in this morning and you're working with people who are a pain, then that's not going to make the job easy. But if you're working with people who are pleasant, it makes it all very much nicer. And everybody, pretty much, I would say everybody in Doctor Who's really nice. They're a good crowd. Okay. Oh, I, 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 Go ahead, Elijah. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, right, what was that, Matt? Mark, I'm um, sorry. It was the Davison set that you've got coming up. So that was my quick follow-up. So, so oh, yeah. yeah, well, I just, yeah. I've, I've, so I've done those, right? Yeah, I did those yeah. just before I left the UK, right? So I did those in London on my way out of the UK. I think I was, yeah. I'll, I'll look in my diary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it'll remind me. What was that one called? The book of the book something. Oh, the, the something book. I love the stories. Oh yeah. I can't yeah. remember. Right. I just saw the ad for that one. Yeah, you're, you're going to ask me some complicated questions. I won't be able to remember the answers. All right. <laughs> so um, you'll have to give up on that one. Yes. Where are we? Yes. Uh, Mark, right, yeah, so where did I do it? I can't find out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or else took a picture up later and say, well, we knew what it was. 
You know, okay, I we did them. We did them. Oh, yeah, there's my there's my diary. Um, we did them on the 26th and 27th of April. I was due to fly on the 28th, but in fact, I didn't. Um, I had to stay on longer because they couldn't find anybody to do my job up in Scotland. <laughs> um, so, so that's 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 that one. Yes, yes. I'm one of these strange people who sells a paper diary. Um, I, 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 I remember going into a meeting and everybody was tapping away. I mean, I do have an iPhone and all that you know, stuff we have to have. But I, I went into a meeting and I just could get the diaries out, right? And I got my diary out and it was like open in a second. And I said, you know, you guys have got, these are fantastic. They're, they're a new invention, but you don't have to do anything. You can just open them and you can immediately see what you're doing. It's like magic, you know? <laughs> uh, I was say, Sophie Alder did the same thing. She showed us her diary. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Elijah, go ahead. Uh, well, my first question for you is, with filming Doctor Who, what was the average filming week like? How was it structured between rehearsals and then blocking and then the actual filming? Okay, so, yes, um, filming first of all, right? In other words, the location filming always happened first. And that took sort of three to five days um, for most episodes. Uh, then you went into rehearsal, and you went into rehearsals for about 10 days, okay? Um, it was in a sort of five-weekly pattern. So first week was filming, as far as I remember. Then we'd do 10-ish days rehearsal. But we'd, on a Thursday, Friday, we'd go into the studio to do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, four days in the studio. And in those four days, you would film half the story. Then back in the rehearsal room, and then you do that all over again, so 10 days, four days. Now, the reason for that was because while we were in Television Centre One, in, in, in the BBC's main building in London, we were in the biggest television studio in the UK with Doctor Who, but it still wasn't big enough to put all the sets up at once. So you had to do it in two blocks, right? Um, so that's that's that, that, that that's the that, that's the, the sort of the reasoning behind that. And then immediately you finish the second studio, you might have a day off, <laughs> or whatever, or two days. Then you were just back into it. It was pretty hard work, I have to say. Um, it was pretty concentrated, um, and long days. You know, studio days were often you know have to be at the studio at seven o'clock in the morning and not get out till ten at night. Okay, Philip, you're up next. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to ask you a wildlife question, basically, just to steer you away from Doctor Who for a little bit. Um, what, what was it like to film in the wilds animals you've never witnessed before in their day-to-day -day habitat? Well, <laughs> one is it's always very interesting, right? I, I would say about my life that I've had, had a, a very interesting life. I've been to incredibly remote places in the world, places you would never get to as a tourist. Um, on the downside of that, I've had malaria and all sorts of other horrible diseases. Oh. Um, but, um, you know, that's, that, that's life. Um, but it is extraordinary. I mean, nothing can prepare you for seeing your first massive crocodile, for example, sliding into the water. And you're relatively close to it. Um, you, nothing, nothing can prepare you for exactly how fast snakes are. Uh, I remember filming with, with a guy and um, it was one of the guys who worked with Steve Irwin and I said, um, mate, do you, you know you were bitten in that last bit? And he said, was I? And he said, yes, yeah. so we'll play it back on the camera. And the snake went <clears throat> on his leg, right? And he had no idea he'd even been bitten. As it happens, the snake had done a dry bite, hadn't put any venom in, right? Okay, so it was just warning him off. Um, but yeah, you, you, it's extraordinary what every animal you work with will surprise you in, in, in some way. Um, yeah, um, obviously I've, I've almost been killed twice by crocodiles. I have to say I've never had a bad experience with a snake. Um, I'll just tell you one of the, the crocodile stories. Um, it, it was that I was walking, I left my cameraman and sound guy and I, and I saw some birds fly up to the end of a what they call a billabong in Australia, or a lake, and it was around the corner. So I left the guys filming, I thought I'd just walk around the corner and have a little explore, which is an absolutely mad thing to do in a place, <laughs> especially with crocodiles. You do not go off on your own, right? I mean, it's absolutely stupid. Um, and there was a, a monitor lizard nest that had been predated, you know, the, the crocodiles eat the eggs, they come up on the banks and they dig, it, dig, dig the eggs out. So I went over to have a look at this nest, and as I did, a crocodile came straight at me out of the water. And it was absolutely petrifying and um, we, we carried big hollow poles with us 
um, bamboo. Because if you hit, the theory is that if you hit a crocodile on the head with a big, a big bamboo pole, yeah. it will stop in its tracks. And the reason for that is that crocodiles fight bashing their heads together. When crocodiles fight, they bash their heads together. And if it's a big sound, it means it's a big crocodile. And the little crocodile thinks, oh no, too big for me, that was a big sound, I'm going. Right? So you hit the crocodile on the head and make a massive sound. The theory is that the crocodile stops. You've probably gathered on this occasion, it did start off. <laughs> <Fertilizer on. laughs> yeah, yeah. But, the, the, I mean, it's a total stupidity of me. And so you do learn, you do learn these things. Um, you, you learn to be very, very careful. And there, but for the grace of God, won't I? And if the crocodile had kept going and dragged me into the water, nobody would actually have ever heard from me ever again. And nobody would have known how I died, I don't think. I would have just disappeared in the bush of Australia. So that's, yeah. yeah. It's all rather worrying. And uh, another one that's quite funny is I, I, I remember when I first went to Africa. I mean, Africa's wonderful. Um, yeah, the smells, everything, and, and it's, it's very, very beautiful. Anyway, we were filming this lion, lioness, with her cubs, and they were literally using a mongoose as a thing to throw from each other, the, the little cubs, um, as animals do in their cruel way. Anyway, I wasn't quite the right angle with my camera, so I opened the door a little bit, and I used the door as a cover, right, between me and the lion, right, mm -hmm. and, and the lionesses, and, and, and I got the tripod on the ground, and, but I, I just couldn't get it right, so I had to step outside the vehicle, right? Don't do it! <laughs> and, so I was filming the lions, right, and another lion, I didn't even see it coming, walked past me. It came behind me and walked right past me. Unfortunately, it took no notice of me. But again, there but for the grace of God was I eaten by a lion. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. I've, had, I've had a few adventures. <laughs> um, and just an add-on question to that one. Um, what are your favourite wildlife um, creatures to shoot when, you, when you're out doing that kind of work? Um, I really like, I do, I do, must admit, I do like filming kangaroos. There's this, a good reason for that. Kangaroos are very inactive during the day. <laughs> <laughs> so you get this wonderful, wonderful early morning light. Kangaroos are active at night, right? It's too hot in Australia. They spend the whole day lying down and panting in the shade. But you get this wonderful early morning light and lots of activity, particularly with the red kangaroos. And they get amazing pictures, you know, of them fighting in the dust and just, just absolutely wonderful. And then at the end of the day, again, you get this fantastic, in Australia, purplish, bluey light and they look beautiful the landscape looks beautiful um, and so yes yeah, that, that's my one of my favorite places in the world is the big red center of australia okay thank you mark Pleasure. okay back to you alex oh i i thought maybe you were going to ask a question um okay um i'm wondering um what what uh type of question i should ask I read on the internet that you also play instruments. Is that true? I used to when I had some time. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I used to, yeah. Um, I mean, I became an actor almost by default from being a musician because my dad was a musician, right? He was right. A, a church organist at the, sh the church that Shakespeare's buried in, in Stratford Avon, Holy Trinity Church. Um, so I was a chorister, and um, then I started writing music for the National Youth Theatre, musical scores. Um, and sort of, uh, I thought, well, I'm working really hard. Acting looks a lot easier than this writing music lark. <laughs> so I then decided I'd become an actor um, and, you know, applied to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and got in. You know, I think they have about 4,000 applicants a year and they take 20. Um, wow. What would I have done if I hadn't got in? Oh, I got into other drama schools is the answer. Um, but um, yeah, I, it, it, was, it, was, it was just by default. But when I first left um, the Royal Academy, I worked for a company called the Micron Theatre Company who travel on a boat all over the UK. And I played the guitar and made an album with them and I wrote all the songs. Uh, and then funnily enough, when, we were, when Lisa Bowman and I were at Salisbury Playhouse, one of the shows we did had a lot of music in it and I learned to play uh, the accordion and so I was doing the music in that. So that's, music's been a big part of my life, but I've, since I've made natural history programs, I, uh, one part of the bit I enjoy about making documentary is I really enjoy doing the music, not writing it, but working with a composer. Uh, working with an orchestra. Um, we're very lucky. We have quite large budgets in natural history sometimes. So we get to work with, you know, with proper composers and proper orchestras. Um, I did some work in Doha and the London Symphony Orchestra recorded some of the scores. I mean, 
bloody amazing experience you know mm. <laughs> so yeah all, all, all that sort of stuff it was um mm. yeah. so um as a follow-up question could you tell me were you able to um copyright anything or were you able to uh perform with a lot of musicians and what that was like uh, well but i mean in the theater it was small groups of people all right um mm. uh, but I, I i haven't i haven't um, copyrighted any any of my music. I mean, I could sit down now and write you a Bach chorale because mm. I had a formal music training. Um, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I don't. You just uh, it's it's funny. I've got an eight year old boy, and Tom says, "What's your hobbies, Dad?" And I say, "Tom, I have not got any time for a hobby. You know, yeah. I haven't. When would I? When would I do? When would I do a hobby? You know, it's hard enough getting through the work and, and making time for you know, making time for him and the family and things. So, um, well, uh, I. He's, yeah. he's going to, I am going to buy a piano soon, right? Because I do play the piano. Um, because I'd like him to have some music in the house. And um, mm -hmm. he can let's play the piano and, you know, and we, can, we can do things together. Well, so I, uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Forgive me, I'm almost done. I, I just figured I'd also ask you something that was not TV or acting related. Okay. <laughs> so, no, thank you. So, thank you very much. Okay, back to Matt. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, hello. Um, so a couple of years ago, you did one of my favorite companion chronicles, Ringfall World. And uh, what was your initial reaction when you were reading the script when you're Mark Strickland having to play Turlo as Janet Fielding's Tegan in the script? Yeah, well, my, my initial reaction is horror. Um, and I, I, only, I only say that because um, I cannot do an Australian accent. Um, if I had to choose, I know this is going to sound ridiculous, because I lived in Australia for so many years. I've worked in Australia. I'm about to go to Australia for five weeks working. Um, but I cannot do an Australian accent. Now, I can do a Birmingham accent. I can do a Scottish accent. I can do French. I can do Dutch. I can do South African, you know. And all that. I can do accents, but I cannot do a bloody Australian accent. And I have this theory that it's because when I went to Australia, I didn't want to acquire an Australian accent. I just wanted to keep my English voice. Um, and and so yeah, initially absolute horror, and I and I and, and I know whenever I've had to sort of impersonate Janet, uh, it's embarrassingly bad. I think. <laughs> Do you agree? <laughs> I, it's yeah. fun. It's fun when people try to do accents yeah. that they're not used to. <laughs> But that's all the fun part, especially when you're like, there goes Tegan moaning again. It was so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can have fun. I mean, that's the thing about the big finished ones. That you, you, you can have, have, have a lot of fun with them. And they do accentuate our characters. Um, I mean, Janet is more whingy in the big finished ones than she, is in, than she actually was on screen. It was, it was tempered back a bit on screen. Mm -hmm. But she's, she, becomes a bit, she becomes a bit of a more comic character in the big finish pro in the big finish things i think but it works because y y you need that i mean sarah's not funny i mean you know, miss her as a character isn't i mean peter's and peter sort of has his moments but you do need some light relief in there i mean turner doesn't go around cracking jokes all the time so the banter between turner and tegan can can be can be really useful to just bring a bit of comedy and speed into it uh, okay. one more, a follow-up one um if we were doing that. Um, he moved to New Zealand many years ago from London. What was the initial decision for the move? A woman. <laughs> then the move. <laughs> the move to New Zealand. Yeah, the oh, move to New know. Zealand. Yeah, I, I met a New Zealand woman. Uh, um, uh, so there you go. Um, and we're still together. <laughs> um, it was also um, somewhere I could get a job. Um, I had a job. I was working for Granada at the time, um, up in Manchester. Um, but I thought New Zealand, a bit like why I went to Australia, I thought New Zealand would be a fantastic adventure. And um, there's a company called Natural History New Zealand, and I knew them very well. And so I was able to get a job here. So, hey, what was going to happen? I didn't know, but this was going to be a great adventure, you know? And I really enjoyed working at, at Granada in Manchester, but I mean, I quite like Manchester, but I'm not a city boy. Whereas here, where I live in New Zealand, it is very beautiful. I mean, to give you an example, we live in a big university town, a big university town, about 120,000. Um, but in, in the harbour the day before yesterday, there was, there was a whale, you know, playing around and a sea lion watching it on the beach. Um, a humpback whale, a right whale, southern right whale. 
and um you know we have the only albatross colony in on on, a, on the mainland in the world in Dunedin we have penguins on our beaches um it's very pretty um and whatever you say about Manchester it's not a haven for wildlife <laughs> and and you know I do I do love being surrounded by by nature I don't live by the sea and people often ask me why don't you live by the sea I live looking at a big wood and I live in a valley and look at this so sort of the side of the valley has got a, got a wood on it and there are lots of birds around where I live. But I don't live near the sea because that does remind me how far I am away from my family. As soon as I sort of see the sea, I can feel how far away England is. So I don't like that as a daily reminder. I mean, it's lovely to go and you know, go for a walk by the sea, but I don't want to see it out of my window. So I do miss England and I miss my family. Uh, okay, back to you, Elijah. Um... I guess uh, with doing directing and acting, when you were first trying to figure out what your career path was going to be, was acting your number one thing? Did you decide, yes, this is what I wanted to do, or did you have something in mind beforehand? Uh, I, I was sort of... <laughs> um, when I was young, I wanted to be a vet, but I'm allergic to cats, so that was never going to work out right. Um, then I wanted to be an architect, um, that, that went on for quite a, quite some time. That was because a very wealthy architect lived in our village and used to used to race around race around in a Lotus sports car. I think it was more related to that than any interest in architecture. Um, and then I thought I might be a musician, but then I did decide I'd be an actor. Yeah, I, I when I was about seventeen, I thought yes, I do want to be an actor. Um, and I think you just have to you, if you want to be an actor, you just have to bite the bullet. Um, you, you can't really do anything else. It's, it's difficult enough of getting work as an actor. You, you can't, I mean, I couldn't be a TV producer and also do a bit of acting. That's not going to work. You know, I have to be 100% concentrated on my other job. Whereas if I went back to acting, I'd put 100% concentration into that. Um, so, yeah. And I was very lucky, wasn't I? I worked really well for 10 years. Um, and uh, that, gave me, that gave me all sorts of options. Um, I mean, I thought I'd come back to England and become a, probably become a you know, natural history presenter. But, um, because that combines the acting with, whereas in fact I ended up being a specialist director of presenters, which is very much using your acting skills. Um, because when, in, in order to get a presenter to give the right performance, it's what drama directors do. If I want a presenter to be quiet and it's, you know, I want it to be quite tense, then I'll go up and I'll, I'll use that sort of energy level. Whereas if I want some fun, I've got to, I've got to be a bit more outgoing and say, right in this scene, right, you know? Um, and there's no difference working with presenters on television than there is actors, to be honest. So I sort of went back to, sort of went back to drama in a way, I suppose you could call it that. Okay, back to you, Philip. Okay, let me just say, I, I, I adored your work on one of the big finish short trips called Gardens of the Dead. That was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked that one as well. That's, that's, that's really one of them. Really enjoyable. So yeah. kudos to you for that one. Now my question for, for my Doctor Who question for you. In Doctor Who, you wore your, were you happy to constantly be recognised as Turlo via the school uniform? And did you have any say in it, uh, in, in any say in it not being part of your look in Planet of Fire? Yeah, the answer to the latter is no, but I had a lot of say in what, in what the original costume was. Um, obviously, it was dictated to by the fact that he was pretending to be a public schoolboy. Yeah. So he had to dress like all the other schoolboys. So, you know, a suit was the obvious thing. Um, but, yeah, we went out in the costume designer and chose the shirt and chose the, chose the ties and chose the shoes. Um, um, John Nathan Turner chose the socks. Um, <laughs> was very bright and colourful. <laughs> when you saw them because he said oh, when, it, when, I, when I first when we first showed him the, the costume he said oh he's not good he said you look like a funeral director I said yes that's just it that's not what I look like alright this guy is bad this guy is going to try and kill the doctor so we don't want him dressed like a clown um, and you know Peter's costume was quite bright wasn't it it was you know, yeah. right mm -hmm. and verses. Janet was always in these fluorescent dresses of some sort or you know something she, she often was um, Sarah wasn't in it that, that much with me, but um, you were never going to mistake me for Sarah. But I, I, I really liked it, the fact that I, I didn't have the same, that I didn't keep changing costume, because I thought that it also gave Turner a certain seriousness. 
you know, that he wasn't, he wasn't this, he wasn't interested in what he looked like. He was interested in more. Getting the job done. Yeah, other things, right? Yeah, yeah. killing the doctor and um, trying to get back to his planet, and you know, and all those sorts of things. Whereas it was, it was quite a relief, I think, for audiences that Teller didn't give a damn what he looked like. He's a bit like me, actually. I believe it or not, I don't. I, I sh tend to go shopping very, very rarely. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, yeah, that, 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 that does you know, make me recall, you know, all those scenes you did with Valentine Dial. That, yeah. that must have been very intense. You know, well, it was. It was, I mean, it was. it was a difficult tightrope to walk because, look, there's this great big scary guy with a bird on his head, right? Um, and so you have to be really scared. That's where the acting comes in. And, you know, to be quite young as Turner was and be scared. Um, it, I don't think it, I mean, I think that this, it's very difficult on Doctor Who. You, you do what this tightrope between overacting and underacting. So it's easy to underact as it is to overact in Doctor Who. The thing is, you see, is that Doctor Who isn't real life. This is why science fiction as a genre is very difficult for actors to work in because it isn't a real world. You're not having the same emotion, emotional contact with other characters. Um, the characters are quite stylized. Um, and that I think goes right the way through 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 um, through science fiction. So it's in fact very difficult to be a good actor in science fiction. I think it's the most difficult genre of all. Um, and I'd just come off a soap opera um, where you know you're just being yourself, I suppose, and you know, you've got a girlfriend, you know, and you have a, that relationship, and you have it was in a hospital, and then you have you know the normal hospital relationships, and I was an ambulance driver, and but that's very easy to do. I mean, that's, that's hardly requires acting, to be honest. Whereas crashing on spaceships and fighting aliens and all that sort of stuff, that is a whole leap of imagination. And you have to believe that it's as real as it is acting in a hospital drama. Um, otherwise, you're going to look an idiot. Yeah, especially when you're doing like, you know, blue screen work and whatnot, because you have to actually picture what's going on, you know, whereas, yeah. you know, and if you're doing a, you know, a show like, you know, a soap opera, you know, everybody's around you and all that. But meanwhile, you're when you're acting up against a screen, it's like, OK, there's just a screen there. <laughs> well, yeah, well, there, there's, there's just a screen there. I mean, I, I remember in, in, in one of them, um, it was, uh, oh gosh, come on, Mark, um, the, the Enlightenment. But, I, you know, where I'm thrown off into space right and and i'm and as you know it's when i was being so it was it was the tractators one which one was that was that from, that was from tires from front yeah oh, yes, i was right i was right yeah. uh, my goodness i'm surprising even myself now <laughs> um yeah no i was you know being sucked out to space and and you know the production manager said okay mark now this is the scene where and there was a piece of there was a bit drawn on on the on the floor the studio floor with chalk and it had been painted blue around it, right, for the blue screen. Right? So, okay, so this is where you, you're being sucked out of the spaceship and you're crying tractators, tractators, and you're foaming at the mouth and screaming. Okay, off we go. Now, that isn't easy to act. You, you just, one of the things about being an actor is that you mustn't have much self-consciousness because otherwise how could you lie on the floor in front of 40 people in the studio screaming tractators, tractators, and foaming at the mouth? It has to be real. You just have to just in that minute go there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's difficult, difficult stuff. Actually, when you were thrown out into space, that was in life, but the track is one where you're, because you were screaming. Well, you were well, out being out yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. Um, get, get Sylvester McCoy to tell you a story. He told, he told me a lovely story because he was out here doing Lord of the Rings um, with um, uh, Ian McKellen, obviously, who thank God of. And, um, so he's out here doing that. Or is it, was it The Hobbit that Sylvester, Sylvester did? Mm -hmm. Yep, The Hobbit. Yeah, The Hobbit Sylvester was in. Right. So anyway, he's, 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 he's in New Zealand. He must have been here for a, a couple of months. I think he did three days on location. All the rest was green screen. And when he met Sir Ian McKellen, uh, 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 and they had a, a, a scene together, actually acting together. Apparently, Sir Ian said, and he said, oh, God, Sylv, an actor. I'd be longing to see one of those for weeks. Um, it's just all done green screen, you know, and so you're you are acting on your own. And it's it's a it's a it's a very difficult skill. Yeah. Okay. Back to you, Alex. 
Uh, sorry, I was having a little trouble hearing Mark, but I'll ask the question anyway. Um, so, uh, sort of as a plug for yourself, and I admit this, um, is there any documentaries or books that you've published that anybody who's watching this uh, can locate? Well, I think you can get, you could get most of them. I would, I would think, I mean, anything that's been made for National Geographic, um, you, 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 you'd get if you knew the title. I mean, I've made hundreds of documentaries. Um, I mean, all of the Steve Owen films, I'm sure, are readily accessible. Because um, um, I made, you know, a lot of films with Steve Owen as a, as a producer. Um, it just becomes a, ma a massive documentary. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm just talking about um, science fiction and uh, Mark Williams, who is um, Ron Weasley's father in, in, in the Harry Potter film. So I did three series with the Discovery Channel on industrial history in, 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 in the UK. Industrial revelations, and on the rails, and something else. Um, and to get another science fiction one, um, uh, Red Dwarf, um, the actor in Red Dwarf, who was, oh, come on. Ah, played the butler in film as well. Oh. Okay, um, sorry about that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no, no, no I'm having trouble it's... hearing you, unfortunately. The volume is uh, very low, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, is, it, is, it, is it me look, turning no, away? I'm, I'm hearing you just oh, fine. I'm trying my best. I'm sorry. Um, you must be on your end. Yeah, so yeah. must be going on on your end on that end. Okay, back to you, Matt. Thank yeah, you. if you put if you put Mark Strickson in right, and you go onto Wikipedia, I think you'll get a pretty full list of my documentaries, um, or certainly certainly a very good idea, right? And then, um, I mean, you can get a lot of them just you know through Amazon and that sort of thing, right? You know. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sure the folks out there will have to look up a few. Okay, back to you, Matt. All right, this is two in one, which goes back to your enlightenment thing. You showed um, in a couple of years ago, you did Phantom Films, where you did a brilliant demonstration, which was on YouTube, of how you did the scene um, that you were demonstrating. It was so funny, you doing Tractatus, Tractatus, Tractatus on, the, <laughs> on it. And I just thought that was brilliant. But just a question. I, I, did, I, I did that to just prove that sort of you just have to just sort of... Um, you lose that self-consciousness. You you should be able to do it at any time. It doesn't matter if it's a Doctor Who convention or wherever it is. You, you, <laughs> you don't feel embarrassed about doing it. It's, 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 it's acting. Yes, which comes to, you have been doing this since about the 80s, haven't you, doing cons? Since living in New Zealand, do you find it a lot harder with the travel or did you find it a lot easier when you were in London? Well, uh, I, I did the reason I did four conventions in the UK just before I left. Um, and that, I did one every two weeks. And that was because, yes, it's almost impossible for me to do conventions from New Zealand. Um, I was due to do one in Kansas. Um, My day, yeah. Yeah, then I had to cancel that um, because of this dinosaur series I'm making. I am due to do one in February of next year. Ooh, Gallifrey One, would that be? Gallifrey One, yes. I am due oh. at Gallifrey One. I'll be there. Oh, well, we shall be able to say hello. Yeah, but that will be the first one I'll have done in, you know, a year or so. Yes, because um, you went to retirement from America, from what I've heard. Um, well, it's just, it's just finding the time to go there, right? I mean, it's a week of your life to go and do two days in America, if you're coming from New Zealand. You know, um, it, particularly if it's East Coast America, um, it's not like popping over from England. Um, it, it's a, it's a lot harder. I mean, I have to fly Dunedin to Christchurch, Christchurch to somewhere, somewhere to you know, Los Angeles, Los Angeles on. And so, it's not only that it takes you two days to get there and two days to get back; it's that it's knackering as well. And that if you're coming back and doing a job in, with no recovery time. Um, it, it, it becomes a very silly thing to do, to be honest, because you just be too tired. All right, um, last one. Um, what was your weirdest convention experience? My weirdest convention? You can't ask him that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> my weirdest convention experience? Well, I mean, I think, yes, yeah, you, you can. I mean, I think, I think the, 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 the weirdest convention experience was going to my first Doctor Who convention. Because you have no idea what to expect. And my, I went over with Pat Troughton, 
and we, we sat in the back of a stretch limo coming in from Chicago airport. It was in Chicago. And one of another, another Pat nor I had ever been to America. So it was like stepping onto a film set. It's all so familiar and yet you've never been there. So yeah. that was totally weird, right? Um, English actors are not usually transported around in luxury stretch limos. So that was a little bit peculiar for us. And then getting there and finding 3000 people screaming uh, and having to be, you know, having to be escorted by security guys. The whole thing was most peculiar. Um, and then oh, was, you, it the you get, hmm? was it the one in the Marine? Was it the one with the guys outside dressed as unit soldiers? I remember that we, we just couldn't go anywhere without security. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, I, I can't remember who they were to, to be honest. But um, no, it was just, it was, it was, it was just an, an extraordinary experience because we didn't we didn't have anything like that in the uk at that time mm. you know i mean that's why that's i mean longleat if anybody can remember the um the, the longleat um uh, uh first I've seen of that one yeah i've yeah. seen the video yeah i mean that that was equally as peculiar not least because it wasn't very well organized and there were queues and queues and queues of people and it took three hours in traffic jams to actually get to longleat um because they had never expected that so many people would turn up um, so that was, again, quite a strange experience. <laughs> okay, back to you, Philip. Um, forgive me if I'm, if I'm mistaken about this, but did, do you know the, um, the Black Guardian communicator glass thing that you had? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, was you ever given that as a parking gift, or was that not the case? Oh, no, 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 no. When I was in Doctor Who, they were very, very careful to take everything back, including your costumes. <gasps> Oh, okay. Uh, well, I didn't. I didn't walk away with anything from Doctor Who at all. All right. And speaking of the glass thing, you know, there was there was a, there was a scene. I think it was Enlightenment when you're trying to get rid of it and it stuck to your hand. Was that a, was that like glued to your hand or was that some sort of tape around your hand? No, it was just me holding onto it. Just really? good acting. <laughs> okay. I thought it was sort of like stuck to your hand and glued to it. No. Just... no. Very good. Yeah, you pulled it off pretty well, because when I still watch this today, it does look like, you know, they just, you know, glommed it on there with yeah. something. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> okay, uh, back to you, Alex. Um, um, okay. Okay, um, sorry about that. I'm, I'm having audio difficulties. Everybody's coming in at a whisper, so I'm debating. Um, the other questions I have... Um, did you also enjoy working on the other uh, TV shows that you were on before and after Doctor Who? I saw that you were on a medical drama. I saw that you were on Bergerac, I believe it's how it's pronounced. Yes, yes. Um, I did like that show as well. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, I, 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 did, I did quite a lot. And, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you yeah, written I, any I, I, books or, or anything about your acting, uh, the, the shows you've acted on, or is that not encouraged? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, um, all right. I said, uh, the second part of the question is, have you ever written about or uh, on the web written about any of the, uh, all your acting jobs, or is that not encouraged in the UK? Is that frowned upon? I, I, I think it is, it? it is encouraged. Um, it, it, it's certainly not discouraged, right? I've never done it because I've never had time to do it. I mean, I think, I think, Perhaps I should now tell you what a TV producer's job is. I spend, there's my desk. Right. I spend my life writing, right? Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, I mean, to be a TV producer, you have to be a very good writer, okay? Can you guys still hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, good, good. Yep, yep. Um, so the last thing I want to do, there are two things I don't want to do at the end of the working day. One is write. Mm -hmm. And the other is look at a computer screen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Those are two things I would never ever do for pleasure currently. Um, and I know other actors have written about their, their life and times, and obviously because I've done so much, you know, with the natural history side as well. There's probably a book there, but whether or not I ever get the energy around to writing it, um, I might, I might at one point. We'll see. Okay, back to you, Matt. Okay, Matt, are you there? Yes, yeah, sorry, I just had a bit of a problem. All right, um, just want to think now. Yes, just one thing, one, one thing. If you, um, 
some, one of you asked about two TV programs. I mean, the, the series that I made before the last series, which was called Wildlife War Zone, I'm pretty sure if you put in Wildlife War Zone, for example, that, that was about rhino poaching in Africa, and there's a lot of guns about and a lot of shooting. Um, it's pretty dangerous to film. Um, it was only the second time I've been in a place where there are live bullets going through the air, but it did not wake you up. Mm. Um, so there's, there's, there's one you could look up, Wildlife War Zone. Um, it was made for Al Jazeera channel, six, six and a half hours. It's quite interesting. Okay. Uh, Next up, go ahead, Philip. No, sorry, I skipped over Elijah. Go ahead, Elijah. Um, I was just wondering, I know you mentioned you said you don't have, you said you don't have a lot of free time. Uh, when you do get a chance uh, to relax and have a break, what do you enjoy to do, uh, whether it's with your family or just by yourself, what do you enjoy to do with your free time? Um, uh, I don't really have any free time. It's terrible. <laughs> I mean, when you have an eight-year-old son, you'll realize what it's like. I mean, you, you know, you, you work all weekend. I often have to work Saturday or Sunday, right? Um, it's not a five-day-a-week job, this. Um, and I'm also very aware that I do go away um, filming. Um, and so when I'm here, I try and do as much as I can with Tom. But it's, you know, very time around to soccer and... Yeah, going swimming and I do enjoy swimming. I try and swim most days. I, I suppose I swim about four times a week. But you also need to keep a certain level of fitness for the work that I do. Um, but yeah, no, just, just doing things with, with Tom and um, I hate shopping with a vengeance. Um, I listen to music a lot because I have music on when I'm writing. I have classical music on in the background when I'm writing because it is a very isolating job and you can get to be pretty lonely as a tv producer um yeah it's um it's not as if you, it's it's not social at all and that would probably come as a surprise to people but i mean i often i might spend a week and not see anybody um that's not my job my job is to write episodes and then i go out and field and shoot them but that's a very small part of the job and then it's back into the edit which is another long part of the job which again is fairly isolating. Although you do work with an editor, you don't sit there talking to them. You're looking at the pictures and very, it's very concentrated. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not all, um, you know, um, I don't know. Features. <laughs> pa pa yeah, parties and, uh, <laughs> and, and wine at two o'clock on Friday afternoons, I'm afraid. That's, 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 not, that's not the life of a TV producer. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just pick the. I'll just put this down now. We'll go do some wine tasting, some dancing, so, you know, whatever. Yeah, we got plenty of time. Yeah, right. You know. <laughs> okay, Philip, go ahead. All right, going back to your present project about the dinosaurs. Yes. Yeah. This, this is obviously going to be acquire a lot of um, green screen stuff for you to work with. Is this correct? Yeah, it is. Um, yes, yeah, so we have so we have got a fair bit of green screen. Uh, there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of GFX, right? Uh, visual effects, which have yeah. to be. Um, but in order to make bones come alive and those sorts of things, you do have to, you do have to green screen or blue screen on, on location. Um, but it, in a sense, it's more, it's more about visual effects, this one, um, because our visual effects team are, are going to have to build dinosaurs and those sorts of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and wire models and from one bone construct the skeleton of a dinosaur. So that you see how when that scientist discovered that one bone, it was just one, say, one vertebra from the back of a dinosaur. But you can extrapolate it to the whole dinosaur. So New Zealand, in fact, is a very good place for visual effects because, of course, we have um, Weta Films up in Wellington who've done all the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit films and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So we have a massive, massive sort of stock of graphic artists here. Um, and a lot of people will come to New Zealand just to get their graphics done. So that's another reason why I'm sort of still in New Zealand. It, it's a good place to work. There is a skill base here um, for my business. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going a little over 45 minutes right now. I know, Mark, you, you've got a lot of things scheduled, you said, for today and whatnot. So, well, uh, it's my son's birthday. I've got children coming yeah. around for a party. <laughs> oh, yeah. so we're going to do I've one more thing. I've got, I've got food to cook. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I know you're very busy. Like you said, it's a seven-day-a-week job, and I'm just really glad we were able to get you in for a little longer. So we're going to do one more round of questions, and we're going to say goodbye, and then we'll call it a day, all right? Okay, all right. so... Final round of questions. Let's start with Alex. Go ahead. 
All right, back to normal sound now, thank goodness. Um, That's great. You mentioned before, uh, when I couldn't hear part of the interview, uh, I understand that you also helped bring uh, the crocodile hunter to television, is that true? Yeah, that's, that's right, and that, that explains how I became a natural history producer. Um, I, I, I did my zoology degree and went back to the UK, as I say, thinking that I would be a natural history presenter, and because that combined with the acting. But I sat and I wrote three films. One, one was about snakes, one was about kangaroos, and another was about moths, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and um, a chap, it's a Doctor Who story, this. A, a chap down at a company called Partridge Films in Bristol. Um, a guy called Andrew Buchanan was their head of development. And just before I was in Doctor Who, Andrew Buchanan was a production manager on Doctor Who. Um, which is extraordinary. And sort of seven or eight years later, I mean, no more, yeah, sort of eight, eight or nine years later, he's sitting as head of development for a natural history company in Bristol in England. And he gets these proposals from this guy called Mark Strickson and he can't believe it. Because is it this, you know, it can't be the same guy who was on Doctor Who, because he wasn't a zoologist, right? So in the meantime, I've gone off and done a degree. And I went down to Bristol and saw Andrew and he said, look, he said, we, 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 we would like, to use these ideas. He said, we've got, you've got a choice here. One, we'll pay you for the ideas, but two, you can come in. We won't pay you very much, but you can direct them, right? And I mean, I'd have been mad not to take the second option, so I did. Moved to Bristol, and they didn't pay me badly, and they were paying me a lot more two years later. Uh, <laughs> but it was, you know, it's these things you have, you have to do. You have to grasp the nettle, as they say. And um, one of the films that I did first of all was a film called The Ten Deadliest Snakes in the World. Yeah. And we sent off um, a, uh, a, an e email to zoos and reptile parks and all over Australia. We wanted a really good snake handler. Um, and Terry Irwin sent a video of Steve in, um, Terry is Steve's wife. And we looked at it, there were four of us, looked at it and we thought the guy's either going to be a star or he's going to be an absolute disaster and as it, as it turns out he, he turned out to be a star and yeah. went, went on to do to do many films um so that's yes so through steve Irwin, in a sense i also made a film for on, on kangaroos for national geographic in that batch of filming in australia um yeah that's uh that's 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 how it all how my life panned out okay back to you matt all right um so when you joined Doctor Who, it was like essentially near the end of the Davison era with Janet leaving after Sarah Sutton. How did that feel to see you when you were just coming in and it was an, an end of an era? Well, I didn't stay that long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by design, um, I didn't know Peter was leaving when I decided to leave, right? I, I, I decided to leave because I felt that Tello was not a character that was easy to sustain in Doctor Who. He needed to be the centre of attention. He needed to have a strong role. He yeah. couldn't just lurk around in the background. He didn't work like that. Um, so I wanted to sort of go out with, with some strong stories and go out with a bit more of a bang rather than just drift away, right? Um, and I knew he wasn't going to be killed, so I could always come back. There was, there, there was that. I'm very glad Turner wasn't killed. Um, Sarah had had quite, quite a run, and it was too many people in the TARDIS, Nissa, Tegan, and Turlow. That, that was just too many people, one too many. Um, so Sarah was the obvious one to, to pull first of all. And then I think Janet wanted to leave. I, I, can't, I can't remember, to be honest. Um, um, but, you know, there is a turnover in female companions in Doctor Who, and with Peter leaving as well. We wanted to bring in the... You can't have too many people leaving in one episode. Yeah. <laughs> going and me going, you had to bring Perfectly and Brown in, right? In, if, in, in with Peter. So that, that when he went, it was all about him going, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a quite, a, quite a few um, musical chairs played that year. But um, I think it all worked out. I think the scriptwriters did a good job. They certainly did a good job for me. I felt that your, your exit point was a little bit, you know, I could have done a bit more gun hole exit for you, personally. But otherwise, I'm not complaining. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a bad exit, though. Okay, back to you. 
And it was a good entrance for Perry, so there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. Yeah, you lucky guy. You got to carry Nicola Bryan around on a beach for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, you know. In freaking cold water, that water was so cold. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> That's you how they perceive you. Yeah, I asked Nicola about that. It was <laughs> punishing that shoot. You, you, it looks lovely and blue, and it looks like warm and sunny. You know, there was a wind. The water was freezing. It was nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to you, Elijah. Last question. All right. So, being a part of the Five Doctors uh, celebration story, what was it like to be in that moment of? I'm going to be in a Doctor Who celebration story with technically three returning doctors and having like Richard Herndl back and the little scene from Tom Baker. What was it like to be part of that celebration? Well, it was cool. It was, it was, it was really nice. Um, and it was great to meet all those people. I've always really enjoyed working with Pat Troughton. Um, and he was up in Wales at the same time as, as we were up there doing our bits on the mountain um and i mean john poe is really 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 nice and um yeah it, it, it was it was it was it makes it a little bit special you know i mean that's one of the things when you come into doctor who you don't sort of really realize what an institution it is it does take a little bit of a time to percolate through to you but then when you realize what an institution it is doing something like the five doctors um it, it, it does become a special event for you and I mean, how many people 20 odd years after working in a, 30 odd years after working in a, in a television series are, are, are still talking about it and are doing the occasional appearance? Um, it, it, it is, it is amazing. It is like, you know, it's, it's a Star Trek, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's one of those iconic programs. And, and for an actor to be in an iconic program, every British actor wants to be in Doctor Who at some point. You can't say you've been an actor in Britain if you haven't been in Doctor Who. <laughs> and that's why they get such great casts. It's, um, it's, it's fun, and it's something you can take, tell your kids about. Okay, Philip, final question. Okay, um, if you had the chance to work as a companion against any other Doctor that, that has been so far, who would it be, and what kind of character would you like to have been play, playing? I think I would have enjoyed working with Pat Troughton. Um, very nice man, very good actor. They yeah. all are, but I mean, I think that he's, he was a very generous actor as well. Um, the sort of character that worked with Pat, um, I mean, I think Fraser's, Fraser's character, Jamie, worked, 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 worked very well with, with, with Pat because he was, he was quite active, you know, quite straight in a sense. So the straight guy to Pat's funny guy. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, so it, it would have to have been a sort of straight character. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'd want to be in a kilt. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, think, I, I definitely would have enjoyed working with Pat. So, um, and, but I, I loved, look, I loved them all. The, the, they were all lovely, when, the doctors, when I met them. And Peter was an absolute joy to work with. I think Peter is a very underrated actor. I think Peter's a quite superb actor. And I think he's underrated because he does a Michael Caine on us. Michael Caine is always Michael Caine. But that doesn't mean he can't be completely different in his parts, in the parts he plays. Oh, he's me. always Peter Davison. But the, um, the, 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 what he brings to that is, uh, subtle. is, is subtlety, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and honesty, yeah. And um, I, think, I think that, yeah. Yeah, so I, perhaps I should say Peter. Go and work with Peter again. As long as you don't have to dye your hair blonde just to separate, I mean, Jesus. Yeah. The blonde, yeah. Well, no, well, it, it is sort of, it, it's all my own hair, it's not dyed. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the, this is its normal colour. It goes blonde in the summer when the sun hits it a bit. Um, yeah. No, this time of year. I mean, I've just had two winters in a row. I'm looking about as bad as I can. <laughs> <laughs> but I, had, I had a Scottish winter, and then I came out here for a New Zealand winter. It just coming into spring in New Zealand. And um, Scottish winters are as cold as New Zealand winters. So I've had uh, a pretty miserable year's weather so far. Um, okay let's go around and get the farewells from everybody farewell final thought all right um let's start with alex go ahead 
Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to have, uh, ask questions and to speak with you. I'm sorry about the sound difficulty, but it still was a very pleasant experience. Thank you. My, my pleasure. Thank you for your time, too. It was a pleasure to do. Okay, Elijah? Uh, thanks for taking the time to do this interview. I know you're a busy man, but it was a very enjoyable experience. Yeah, I've got balloons to blow up now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Matt? Uh, it was nice to see you again, Mark, and to turn up this week, I thought the Black Guardian was holding you hostage. It was really nice you were here. <laughs> well, not nice, not, 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 nice to have a wave, a friendly wave from England as well. So you take, you take care. And as I say, next convention I'm doing is, is, is Los Angeles, um, Gallifrey. But um, I, I finished this contract um, sort of June, July next year, June, July, August next year. And I'm going to take a little break after that. And I'm de definitely, I'm going to come home. And, I mean, I'll probably briefly come back to see my parents in between. But I'll come back for a few weeks then in, in the summer of 2017. Uh -huh. So if anyone's <laughs> in England, that's when you're lo most likely to see me do an appearance again. Uh, yeah. Just tell Phantom Films you're on standby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Philip. Mark, it's been a pleasure meeting you for the first time and speaking to you for the first time. I've learned a lot. It's been fun and uh, had fun at your son's birthday party and don't get too drunk, okay? No, no, I won't. I won't. No, we're going to laser tag as well. Oh, man, you're going to have a bad back. <laughs> I'm going to be shattered by the end of the day. I you. you will be. But thanks again, Mark. Thanks again. And, you know, on behalf of myself and everybody out there watching, I just really want to thank you for coming on, Mark, because I know you you have such a hectic, hectic schedule, and I'm just glad you were able to you know, come and sit down and share an hour of your time with us. Well, my, my pleasure. As I say, it's, it's always nice. I, do, I don't not do conventions because I don't enjoy them. I enjoy conventions when I do them. Um, so, yeah, um, come August next year, I'll do a few more. But I look forward to seeing everybody again then. But thanks. Okay. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks for the interesting questions. Yeah. Uh, and um, yes, as I say, I'll go and blow up balloons, cook little sausages, and all the other things I'll have to do for the party. Okay, so on behalf of myself and everyone out there, have a great night. Okay, I'll just show you